Over the last 36 years, there have been a lot of mediocre video games based off of the Alien franchise. But in 2014, Creative Assembly released Alien Isolation, which perfectly captures the spirit of the original 1979 Alien film. The reason Alien Isolation is such an effective adaptation is that it takes what is unique to Alien as a film and translates that into the language of video games. A large part of Alien's identity is its cinematography. The slow panning shots, hard shadows, and occasional transitions to the spaceship exterior all serve to make Alien feel like Alien. As a video game, Alien Isolation can't directly replicate these characteristics, but it still finds ways to express them within the context of its own medium. To understand how this is accomplished, we'll need to dissect the camera work and lighting of the original Alien film, starting with director Ridley Scott's use of camera position. Plug us in. In everyday life, we're used to looking at people at eye level, or close to eye level. So when there's a shot in a movie that's taken from below the character looking up at them, it feels unnatural and makes it seem as if something's just slightly off. I cut up and took notes on every shot in the cinematic release of Alien, and out of the 838 shots with characters in them, 452 of those are taken from either far above or far below the character's eye line. That's roughly 54% of the shots. There's a shot I really like near the end of the film, where Ripley, the film's protagonist, gets onto an escape pod and thinks she's finally safe from the alien. The camera is at eye level and everything feels normal. But then, there's a subtle musical cue, and the camera slowly shifts upwards to hint to the audience that they're not safe quite yet. And sure enough, the alien appears. <coughs> These camera angles are something that's integral to the cinematography of Ridley Scott's Alien. So how do you replicate that in a first-person video game, where you don't always have control over the player's camera? One way that Creative Assembly does this is by designing the game's environments with verticality and camera angle in mind. For example, some of the hallways in Alien Isolation are divided horizontally, with an upper and lower section separated by a rail. So if an enemy walks through the upper section, you're forced to sneak through the lower section, looking up at the enemy as you pass them. Near the end of the game, the space station you're exploring begins to collapse into a nearby gas giant. The designers emphasize this by rotating the camera slightly so that the entire level appears tilted. Gary Knapper, one of the lead designers on Alien Isolation, says, The game originally started out as a third-person game, which gave us more license with the cameras. But once we saw the alien up close in first person, we had to go with it. To show moments of flair with the camera work, we use moments like climbing ladders, getting into vents, and numerous alien kills. Then of course, the cutscenes and cinematics were where we could mimic the style and evolve on it to hit the emotions we wanted to evoke. These are really cool ways of affecting the player's camera, but what I find truly innovative is how the game's mechanics encourage the player to create these awkward camera angles on their own. You play as Amanda Ripley, a human engineer with almost no way of actually fighting the alien. You're going to be spending most of your time crouching, hiding under desks, and tilting your head around corners. Because you're in this horror environment, and because you don't want to be noticed, the way you play the game is close to the ground, looking up at things. The player naturally creates these awkward camera angles because the game's design reinforces that playstyle. You can also see this in the way Alien Isolation handles its vents. Most areas in the game have these vents in the ceiling, and if you walk under them, the alien might jump down and kill you. When this happens for the first time, it's terrifying. And for the rest of the game, you're constantly looking up at the ceiling trying to avoid any vents the alien might jump down from. Again, 
the player is recreating the same extreme angle shots from the original film just by trying to stay alive. In the film, Ridley Scott often places the camera in a cramped or awkward position so that the audience only has a limited view of what's going on. As the audience, we want a clear, wide shot of the scene so that we know where the alien is at all times. Instead, we get a close-up of someone's face, or a shot of a cat. In the game, the player has the freedom to move the camera around to get the view they want, but chooses to restrict their own view to better play the game. Players are often positioning a large object between them and the alien, obstructing the alien's view but also limiting their own. Or stuck leaning against a wall, not wanting to move in case the alien notices them. Or trying to access a save station, hoping the alien doesn't kill them from behind. But there's another characteristic of alien cinematography that's just as important as its camera work. The lighting. Hard shadows, anamorphic lens flares, and a predominantly blue color palette form the basis of Alien's visual identity. Occasional shots of the spaceship exterior segment the film's narrative, but also provide a nice visual break from the rest of the film's claustrophobic indoor lighting. Alien Isolation does a really good job of mimicking the style. Creative Assembly even goes so far as to give their selectable items the same stretched out anamorphic lens flares that the original film has. And the shots of the spaceship exterior find their way back into the game in the form of loading screens, which segment the game's levels similarly to how they segment the film's narrative beats. But while the Alien film is just under two hours long, a typical playthrough of Alien Isolation can last upwards of 15 hours. Seeing the same high contrast blue color palette over and over again can get tiring. So how do you introduce visual variety into a franchise with such a distinct visual style? The Alien Isolation team started by creating a replica of the film's Nostromo ship, experimenting with how the film sets were lit, where the lights were placed, and how the filmmakers bounced light around the set. Ben Hutchings, Alien Isolation's lead lighting artist, explains, We experimented and created a few rule sets for our lighting that produced a strong aesthetic which was close to the film. We then needed to expand this rule set for the environments that were not found in the original movie. We had rough mood boards to set out palettes that would be used for each environment, and help build a sense of diversity while maintaining a strong aesthetic driven by the source material. Applying the rules that got us a close match to the film's lighting worked really well. It's very easy to push things in a certain direction when it comes to sci-fi environments, but having those guidelines to ground us really helped keep us in the same visual space. Guidelines like avoiding direct lighting as much as possible, opting for light sources that are slightly occluded or partially blocked by an object like a vent fan, and placing lights so that they graze across walls and ceilings to ground the lighting in the scene. One of the problems when creating these rule sets is that the lighting in Alien, while effective, doesn't make a lot of sense. When the crew is celebrating Kane regaining consciousness in the medical room, the area is perfectly lit. But when the crew is searching for the dangerous facehugger in the exact same room, it's super dark. It feels like maybe someone should turn on the lights. At the end of the film, when Ripley thinks she's safe, we see this blue light flashing at a slow and steady pace. The alien suddenly appears, Ripley freaks out, and the blue light is flashing like crazy. There is an explanation for this, you know. What's happening is that the lighting is reacting to the emotions of the characters in the narrative of the story. When the characters wake up, the lights turn on. When the characters focus, the lights dim. And when the characters freak out, the lighting freaks out. The film has a great link between pacing and visuals. Creating urgency and drama paired with a great audio treatment is really powerful. We worked a lot on these sort of sections in the game. The player is always doing things for some reason or another, like the characters in the film. And having the player see the effect they're having on the environment is really engaging. Lighting can really drive that, whether it's powering up or triggering an alarm. Being able to use lighting dramatically to affect the environment adds so much more emphasis to these moments. As the player wanders around the desolate spaceship, the ship's lights reawaken as if caught off guard by the player. The fact that the lights turn on in a slow sequence and never all at once give the ship a worn down, uneasy character.
While the interactivity of games can be a powerful tool for the game's lighting, it can also provide a unique challenge. The Alien film makes heavy use of strobing lights, but the strobing lights in Alien Isolation are a lot more subdued. If a film uses a strobing light, every audience member will see that strobing light for the same amount of time. But in games, the designers don't know how long a player will be exposed to the strobe effect, so they have to be more careful with its use. You can see this most prominently in Alien Isolation's Last Survivor DLC, which directly recreates the escape sequence at the end of the film. Now, while these strobing lights have been heavily subdued in the game, Creative Assembly manages to recreate this effect through Alien Isolation's flashlight. The player has a flashlight to help them navigate through the game's darker levels, and the flashlight's limited battery means that players will often be strobing their flashlight on and off to save power. This recreates that eerie strobing effect, but also allows the player to control the strobe's pace. This is a good example of the game designers tying together the visual aesthetics of the film with the mechanics of the gameplay. Rowan Clark, one of the game's lighting artists, says that when it comes to lighting for games, we generally start with areas of gameplay interest, so navigation purposes and objectives. This allows us to help the player know where they're meant to go. We then do a detailed pass to beautify the area so it matches the mood. Players generally head towards the brightest area first, which in the case of Alien allows us to focus on using the darkness as framing. The lighting acts as another lever for the designers to both guide players and modulate difficulty with. In many ways, a well-lit but loud space was just as dangerous as a quiet dark spot, as you need to both hear and see the alien to stay alive. What makes Alien Isolation such a good adaptation is that it takes the characteristics of the original Alien that make it unique as a film, the lighting, camera work, transitions, and it recreates those characteristics in the language of video games. If your adaptation ignores the qualities of a work that are specific to its medium, you'll lose that work's identity. The challenge is how you translate those qualities into video games, and Alien Isolation does this masterfully. Yeah? Yeah.